Um, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Roger Fritz, and I also have along with me uh, Barnaby Stark. Um, I'm based in California, and he's based in uh, England. And I wanted to, you know, basically introduce him, and then we're going to both go through um, this uh, a PowerPoint presentation that we put together, um, combined between the two of us um, around um, AC to DC uh, motor conversions. Um, we have a combined amount of years of almost um, 70 years experience um, doing this between he and I. Um, and so we felt it'd be very important that we shared um, some information that we've learned over time. Um, as you know, I, uh, I have this group called the Nikola Tesla's uh, Collaborations, and you're all welcome to join that. Um, there's a, a LinkedIn address up here. If you just put in Nikola Tesla into your LinkedIn um, and then look for collaborations, you'll find this this group. And uh, you know, please be welcome to join it. Um, he was a genius well before his time, and um, what we have what we've found is, is that a lot of the information and um, technologies and things that were you know developed um, in the 1900s um are not necessarily the same as today the principles are the same but we're tending not to uh take all the all the details in, into action and then actually getting um you know failures and motors and controls and um, various things so we felt it'd be good to you know bring this information forward um i own this book over here it's actually it was in the 1900s um, early 1900s um i call it tesla's bible but um, you know, he was very smart about um, all the different types of motors. Um, so I'm gonna, I always play this little video. Some of you may have heard this before, but I think it's important to know who he is. Get to go here. When you think of electricity, you think of Edison. But there is one electrical genius who is nearly forgotten. A man who dreamed of giving the world an unlimited supply of energy. His name was Nikola Tesla. This is the story of a modern Prometheus who changed the world with electricity. It was Nikola Tesla who captured the power of Niagara Falls with his alternating current system and made it possible to transmit electricity to all of America and the world. Suddenly knew he could recreate this rotating field by powering the coils of a motor in different steps or phases, like the pistons of an engine. The resulting forces of magnetic attraction and repulsion would literally twist the rotor in a circle, the electrical equivalent of the wheel. And all this was accomplished with alternating currents. It would soon turn the wheels of industry around the world. Tesla was ready to unveil his motor to the world. The subject which I now have the pleasure of bringing to... So, the, the reason I, I play that is that um, a lot of you also know of Edison. Um, Edison was the one that was very heavily involved in the development of DC machines. And the re main reason why they use DC is... Uh, Hello. Originally, originally was actually so that we could, um, uh, you know, change the speed of the motor. So that's why um, on plastic extrusion, um, a lot of them are still, you know, direct current motors um, and using a DC drive. Um, and, you know, gradually, you know, newer machines are all coming out with, you know, AC drives of an induction motor um, because of the invention of the inverter. Um, this happens to be a picture of um, the uh, original circuit diagram that I had uh, acquired from uh, Toshiba back in the early 80s when I started really messing with BFDs. And simply it's a circuit where we basically take the three-phase sine wave power, um, convert it to DC power um, to diodes, um, this has to be an inductor in here that actually helps um, smooth out the power and the capacitors that smooths out the DC. And then with um, IGBT transistors, um, we're building PWM power 
um, back to the motor. But that way we can control that speed and control the um, the frequency um, and the voltage. And so doing that, we're able to control the motor, um, you know, in speed. Um, there are some, you know, areas where you um, have to be very aware of um, is also the, the stall torque um, and speed ratings of a DC machine. Coming its, out speed, the- its speed curve um, tends to be um, different than a, you know, an induction motor. So it is key and very important, um, you know, to, to understand that, um, you know, what those torque curves are like, you know, as you're converting things over. Um, I want to go ahead and introduce um, Barnaby. Um, Barnaby, you can chime in here um, as we go through these um, uh, slides. Um, and he owns ACDC drives out of England, um, and they do a lot of retrofits. Um, he's offered several pictures of multiple ones that uh, you know have been done, um, and it should be helpful. So this is a picture of, I think, a DC machine um, that he was converting. Um, and maybe you can you know chime in and see. Can you can you speak, Barnaby? Or can you hear you? Barnaby, are you still there? Huh, I can't hear your, vi- I can't hear your voice. Oh, there we go. Is that any better? Yeah, now I can hear you. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, yeah so this is a uh, extruder with, um, we ran new cables to the, uh, um, but Barnaby, they're, they're mentioning that when they can't quite hear you, can you speak up a little bit more? Uh, we'll try it. Still a little quiet, but. I think they're saying it's okay now. Is that any better? Yeah, that's great. Thank that's you. Better. Yeah, okay. It's my mic. It was. It's up with, uh... Fantastic. Okay. I don't know how much of that everybody heard. Um, great. Uh, yeah. So basically, uh, just to recap, these the DC motors on the extruders were uh, fed by three separate DC drives and three panels. Um, then we sat down a, um, uh, a three panels, uh, a, a compact, and we reran. So we've got the DC motors here, the blue DC motors. And um, we reran some EMC cable because the DC cable wasn't um, uh, rated for EMC protection. So uh, uh, that was rerunning with some EMC glands. Um, and they actually ran underneath the floor of the factory. They had a ductwork system. Um, distance wise, it was about 10 meters. So it wasn't very far. Uh, we didn't have to worry much about bolt prop. Uh, these are Parker 690 drives, uh, but um, we tend to fit Yaskawa, uh, Nidec, um, uh, or, or any similar manufacturer. We used encoders uh, on this one um, uh, for precision feedback. Uh, not on all applications, we use feedback. Um, some new extruder manufacturers will go open loop without an encoder. Um, It's better with an encoder because you get the performance and the low down torque. Um, Yeah, uh, Roger, what do you you want to go on to anything, any specifics? Um, Well, what you might might want to talk about is also the, um, you know, he he was mentioning a lot about the the motor with the airflow, you know, goes over the motor, as you can see, See on the other machine, this is a DC machine, but they have this blower that pushes the air right through the motor and then you know expels it out over here. So that um, doesn't require the the cooling 
um, to be blown over here. Here, there's no airflow inside the motor other than just a small amount internally. And so that's why the frames tend to be heavier and bigger. Um, uh, I, I would like you to talk a little bit more about torque and speed um, of a DC machine to an AC machine, if you would, Barney. Yeah, so um, I suppose over the years, performance has got better and better with uh, inverters, what we call senseless vector. Uh, and it provides the open, lo open loop torque that we need for extruders. Generally, um, you might you, you may need 100% torque on some extruders, especially when the plastic's been stood in a die or stood in the barrel for a while. Um, some applications, um, we had one application where um, there were, it was something like a 180 mil extruder, it's quite a big extruder and they were recy using recycled PVC and the torque requirement from, even when it's hot, the torque requirement was probably 150% if at all the barrel was left for any time with material in it. So the torque requirement on this on this particular extruder, uh, it would pull tons and tons of amps and and um, uh, to, to break away. Um, so it, it does depend on the extruder. The one in the pictures uh, that we were looking at um, generally were are okay. Um, they do need um, sufficient torque to break away. On this particular motor here, the grey one, um, you can actually see now. This is the old. A DC motor that we took off, it's an AVB, uh, probably around 22 kilowatts, uh, about 2000 RPM again. Um, and we replaced it with that standard four pole, uh, standard frame motor. And you can see sort of size wise, we were able to put it on uh, of, of a similar size. Um, so on this, on this motor, on this pallet, we've got the four spent um, sat on the back. And the reason is with uh, AC motors uh, uh, with the DC motor you've got a force vent that runs all the time which is cooling the motor 100% uh, of the time with an AC motor you may not have the uh, fan blowing if you're in the extrude set 10% you may not have the impeller running quick enough to take the heat away so on extruders because we don't know what speed they're going to be running at we always need force vent to cool the motor uh, consistently, uh, so it doesn't matter what speed it runs at. Um, again, uh, this DC motor now, you can see actually the taco is removed at this point to stop us knocking it off. So this, this DC motor had uh, an analog taco, uh, which standard usually gives us about a 1% speed tolerance. Um, and that speed tolerance can vary with temperature and maybe the demagnetization of the taco. With the AC, with the new AC motor that we're putting on, we put on, uh, it was a either I can't remember it was a two hundred four eight or one hundred two two four PPR encoder, and you can see the little plug on top, the little um, silver plug. Um, that gave us our um, feedback back to our drive um, inside the panel, uh, and that enabled us to give us very very precise speed holding. So you might get one percent with a taco, analog taco. Uh, you'd get typically 0.1%, so a factor of 10 speed holding uh, improvement on, on, on the AC system. Um, so the torque developed by this new AC motor um, is exceeds the, I think it exceeded the old DC, um, but it wasn't quite as quick uh, on the RPM being a four pole. Um, we didn't have to worry about torque because we could develop the torque with the encoder all the way down to zero speed. So we could, we could produce 100% torque and the inverter actually had overload in of about 150% as well. So we could drive it another 50% above that um, to, to, to get the torque if we needed. In this particular application, we didn't need it. It, it just broke away fine with the... With the um, uh, um, uh, I think it's um, LD polythene again on the extruder. Um, to get above the, the uh, using an AC motor, um, usually you, you're usually pinned to 
either two pole, four pole or six pole. Um, usually your DC motor might be around 1750 or 2000 RPM. So it doesn't sit really at the same base speed as your old DC motor. So what we tend to do is uh, we go for a four pole motor and then increase the frequency above the base speed to say 65 or 70 Hertz. Just check with the manufacturer if we're going to do that. Just make sure it can. It, it's okay to do that. A lot of motors are balanced beyond their working speed anyway. Um, and at this sort of power, power they, they tend to be well dynamically balanced anyway. So you can run above that sort of uh, base speed. Um, remembering also, if you're running above base speed, you will sacrifice your torque. So usually there's a, there's a, there's a trade-off for getting the speed out of the motor to the actual output torque. Yes. So the thing that I found over time is what's important to us in order to um, actually evaluate a system is, you know, get a picture of this nameplate. Um, uh, you know, also get pictures of the, um, you know, nameplates on the drive uh, itself. You'll have a DC drive, you know, there. And so it makes it makes it easier. And then, you know, critical spot is, is that um, that shaft height. Um, DC motors tend not to have the same base frames um, as an AC. And so the the key point is that shaft height so that, you know, you can line it up correctly into the couplers, you know, into the gearbox. Um, and then what we'd like, you know, is do you have encoder, you know, feedback, you know, on your existing old machine? Um, and so we know how those feedbacks are coming in and also then a little bit about your tolerance on speed. Um, that way we can, um, you know, make sure that we can get the, the proper design um, conversion. Like Barnaby was saying, um, you know, some extruders when you're running, you know, PVC, they have such extreme torque requirements, you know, compared to like, uh, you know, poly um, film. Um, those are, you know, almost run like water once you start, you know, getting them, getting them warming up. But some of that PVC is, you know, really, really tough stuff in that you know, extruder barrel. And so you've got to make sure that the motor is going to produce the torque, you know, necessary. Um, just, just, just reminding me, Roger, looking at that picture, um, go back again to that previous picture. We can this actually one? see, a, yeah, that one. If you look at the, the base where the motor is on, you can actually see a little black pen line across the base. You see that black pen line? Where, oh, this one? No, that, I'm not that is actually where we can back line. You see that? Just where the hole is in the back, back, back plate. Where, where the hole is, where the motor is, is the hole. Down, 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 down. down. Oh, here? There, there, yeah. So there's a line that runs across there. Can you see that line in the... In the oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That line there. That, yeah, that was... We drew that line on to actually angle grind out the base plates because we didn't have sufficient height in the shell. Oh, okay. So we actually modified the base plate to accept the AC motor. It was a bit of a trade-off between going square frame on a on a compact one to having a standard motor with cost. And actually, we tried to stick with the standard motor because of cost, but that meant we had to adapt the base plate to accept the increased shaft height. Okay. Um, so that that shows the old one you took out. That's that yeah, one. That's it. That's okay. it. So that. So that's the new motor installed. Uh, you can just see the welding to the edge. There we are. You can see where the welding actually got dropped there. Can you see? You can actually yeah. see the ledge being taken out. So that was all fabricated on site to adapt the uh, correct correct height. Okay. Uh, that's the new AC drive for it. Again, that's the 690 Parker. Um, uh, that went in it, it, um, just the same size as, just a bit smaller than the old DC drive, which was nice. Um, and we took in the um, uh, uh, power. Um, the 690 doesn't have, um, it's actually, it's a few years ago now. Um, the 690 doesn't have safe torque off. Um, so on this one, you can just see the contact to the right. So we use, we utilize the old uh, AC contactor for the DC drive for the, for the sort of isolation. Uh, on newer systems, our newer drives, we can get away with having just using the safe torque off. 
So the Yaskawa GA700 and the, the, we use a, uh, maybe a NIDEC or control techniques. Um, M701 has a um, uh, safe talk off built in. So often on an extruder application, because the risks are low, the uh, we can use these the, the seal rated uh, safe talk off. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to go into a couple of things that I've been involved in also that you might want to be aware of. Um, this happened to be an extrusion machine that was in the um, New England that I was working on that had a uh, uh, 75 kilowatt um, a DC motor here going through belts into the gearing. Um, and what we what we had installed is there are these new square frame um, high torque um, motors that actually have a very unique rotating field in them. Um, and this is actually um, the install of the um, the principal. Uh, this is. shows the um let's see if I can get that screen to go off of there. I don't want to do it, but but it, but it actually shows um this was developed by a group um out of Germany and Turkey um that um have made this uh what they call the Limprong <laughs> um design of a motor and it's got two rotating fields in it. So as you see here as this the actual rotor turns backwards, but they use a four pole machine on the outside. They layer inner, inner uh, magnets in here and then another set of magnets on the rotor. And from that, what happens is, is the motor, the rotor turns backwards compared to the rotating field on the outside. And so what we had done is took um, this machine and actually tore all the gearboxes off and everything and directly connected this you know, to the motor. And um, because it's very high pole, um, you can get up to 66 to 120 20 poles um, inside that motor. Um, the torque is extremely high. Um, and then it feeds directly to the barrel and you eliminate the gearing. Um, the efficiency, efficiency change was dramatic on this application. Um, they were running some PVC um, we took the power draw from almost 45 kilowatts down to, um, I think it was 21 um, when we were running at the same speed um, because we had no losses. Um, this happened to be a, a one that was on an extrusion machine that was put on a um, uh, 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 pharmaceutical or medical extruder. data um, of the um, of the gearbox if we're going to be taking the gearbox out we have to have the data of that gearbox um, so that we can properly calculate that torque um, you know power because as we as we put the magnet I and mean, when we when we're trying to do it without gearing um, we have to make sure um, we have the exact um, you know torque requirements um, especially when you get into a PVC machine so again, what we're doing with the with the first machines are is we're taking that rotating field um, that you have in an induction machine, um, which is here, and it's inducing it into the rotor, you know, from the sine wave. Well, in order to change that speed, 
we're changing the sine wave. We're building new ones. Um, and that way we're able to, you know, control that speed of the rotor. Um, otherwise, before we had to use the DC machines um, that were in the past. Um, some other um, areas that I'm heavily involved with is with ESA, it's Electrical Apparatus Service Association. It's a worldwide group of uh, motor people. Um, and we're very key also about um, voltage balances, um, you know, what, how it affects torque, um, you know, problems that could be caused. Um, and also that when you're doing a retrofit to DC, um, because you're, you're from DC to AC, um, you have to make sure that you choose the right motors um, because these have, you know, spike resistant wire in them. These have the blower on the back and the, you know, encoders and feedbacks to them. Um, and we have a full line of these that, you, you know, we can help you with, you know, properly sizing the, you know, the AC induction motor if we go that way. Um, or we can also go to the square frame, um, you know, design machines um, and eliminate even some gearing if needed. Um, we're also very key. Um, DC is um, relatively creates a lot of um, uh, the power factor. Uh, normally, is very low. Um, where a AC machine, um, the power factor is high, but you do have to um, be aware of that because of this shows the the ripple um, of the firing of those diodes in here. This is a waveform. Um, this is the voltage here you'll see these ripples that happen um, from how it pulls the power, you know, in to refill those charges, those capacitors as you're drawing the load. So this will vary, but that's called harmonics. And so, you know, this is typically like your third or fifth harmonic. Um, and so I, I use a lot of these um, fluke meters um, that are very helpful to me um, over time. And they really give us the snapshot of the power. And I wanna show you this little video of uh, why I use this particular meter. Introducing the Fluke 438 Power Quality and Motor Analyzer. The Fluke 438 is a multi-purpose test tool designed to improve troubleshooting on electric motors and minimize downtime. Whether you're in a process plant or discrete manufacturing, electric motors are critical to your operation's success. The Fluke 438 lets you quickly gauge electrical performance, power quality, and mechanical performance of industrial motors. Using three-phase electrical measurements on the input and motor rating plate data, the 438 calculates torque, the most critical mechanical performance variable, speed, load on the motor shaft, and overall efficiency without the need to install mechanical sensors. All this with a single tool, and all while the motor is running so you don't sacrifice uptime. Power quality issues, such as unbalance and harmonics, can cause motors to run hot, eventually stressing windings and accelerating failures. Motor failures lead to costly downtime, and the cost of waste associated with inefficient motors adds up. When testing direct online motors with the new Fluke 438, you get both power quality information and mechanical performance data in the same test with a single tool. With an intuitive user interface, optimized current probes, and at-a-glance motor status screens, the Fluke 438 gives you the motor troubleshooting information you need to make better maintenance decisions and keep your plant up and running. Con so the reason I bring that up is um, that you know, harmonics um, also distort the, the current waveform, but they also distort, you know, some of the main power waveforms. So something we've, we run into a lot, you know, especially in DC um, factories, uh, we, we find that there, there tends to be um, a lot of noise that can be created. Um, and so these type of filters are, are designed to have these inductors and capacitors in here to filter out the um, the noise um, and bring the waveforms back into alignment. So this happened to be a uh, a test um, that was done, you know, before, um, you know, with with the meter. And you can see 
this is the voltage waveform. And then this was the current waveforms that we're feeding. And you can see after we put the filtering in, you know, how it cleared it up. And so the, the again, your voltage then um, was much more, much more stable and your current was, you know, basically balanced out. So from doing that, you can see it was 415, you know, volts RMS, um, the same load with 443 um, and 128 amps. So if you just do the amps times volts um, and then times, you know, the power factor, which on this um, was, you know, pretty close to unity, um, there was roughly a 10 kilowatt reduction just from noise. And so that's where your power um, quality is very important and it will make a big difference on your, um, you know, on your ultimate end, end power bill. Um, this happens to be a, a, a better picture of what our more, you know, recent, um, you know, package designs are ready to go. Um, you know, we, we have them in the box. This happens to be a Scala. Um, and, you know, they're all fitted in. They got the disconnect. And so that you can basically pull out the old, you know, put in the new, um, and they have, you know, the disconnect switch, and they're also, you know, rated, you know, for, you know, the NEMA 12 or, you know, IP, what is it, 55 over there, Barney? Yeah, or, IP 55, yeah. Yeah. Um, and they're very quick and easy to program. Um, they have remote capabilities, um, you know, to do it. Uh, you know, from your iPhone, actually, you can, you know, load the app and actually can, you know, see the settings and it talks to a Bluetooth. Um, and we have a lot of quick setup programs, um, you know, things that are all pre-programmed, you know, from the factory, you know, ready to ready to go with the motor. Um, any other points you want to bring up on that, Barney, on the on the drives? Um, yeah, if um, sometimes if we go very large on the AC systems or DC, uh, we go 12 volts, so uh, on maybe half megawatt. In, in the UK, it di differs around the world, but probably around half, half megawatt and, and above. We would try and um, put a 12 pulse system in. So basically, we'd fit a transformer in, which would split our three phases into six phases. And then those six phases would go, you take the, the three phases into one drive and three phases into the other. Uh, and that would basically uh, help the harmonics again and the voltage disturbance with the supply. Um, because like you say, you get third and fifth harmonics, uh, which become increasingly a problem as you go up in size. Yeah, so what, what, he's, what he's mentioning there is that um, when you go put, put an extra transformer in and you do a, a phase shift on those transformers, you end up, instead of providing um, three phases of input, we're actually providing six phases. So it tends to be able to balance out these current waveforms because they draw, um, you know, draw the current, you know, at the various um, uh, frequencies. And so it, it, it you know, it's, it's kind of like it cancels each other. And, um, you know, again, helps bring that, you um, that main voltage form, you know, here, we want to keep that, you know, the voltage here as clean as possible um, because otherwise you'll get, you know, this, this um, harmonic noise will also go on into your, you know, heaters and your, you know, um, other instruments in your facility. And so, you know, harmonic mitigation is very important. Um, So this is a, a better understanding of what you'll see. Um, you know, here's your voltage form. And then these are the various harmonics, both your third, fifth, seventh. And then this is what the what they call resultant, meaning that this is what your RMS values, um, you know, are of current. And so that's why the, you know, total power can be higher um, that you're getting billed for um, based on what these resultants are. So um, we do have the capability of helping with that. Um, and again, because we're firing, um, this is the output um, waveform, we're firing those transistors um, of the PWM. And so this is the, 
the voltage going out to the motor and then the red is the resultant current going to the motor. Um, so it's also important to to utilize drives that um, you know have uh, the high, the higher end ones um, you know that have the uh, the feedback. Um, they're not volts per hertz. They're you know actually sensorless, uh, either sensorless vector or vector um, control, so that we can really control these pulses properly to you know give us as clean a waveform, which also then you know gives us um, you know better torque. And so this is kind of an idea of what you'll see, you know, in harmonics, you know, coming into a machine. Um, normally your third's not too bad. Your fifth and seventh are pretty high on a on a six pulse machine. Um, but if you go to a 12 um, pulse input, um, the fifth and seventh are much, much lower and even clear out through the spectrum, you know, of harmonics. Um, so again, this shows the diode front end here what the um, pulses are coming in. And you can see this is set up as six, you know, six diodes here, but they do build these out with an extra set of trans, um, trans or diodes and then bring an extra phase shift in here and then still bring the power in, but there's many more um, uh, pulses coming in. So, you know, these resultants are lower. So that's what a 12 pulse is, but it, it does require an extra phase shift transformer and an extra set of diodes on the front end of the drive. Um, from that, you'll see here that you'll get these, um, you know, resultants of, you know, noise and harmonics that, you know, come forward. And this is an effect on the, on the AC power. Uh, again, what we're doing is we're basically controlling this PWM and we can go like this is down at 10 Hertz. You can just see we've slowed it, you know, way down compared to up here at 30 Hertz. And it's just controlling that PWM. This is the what Barnaby was saying also about the cabling. Uh, it's important to understand that what cabling we're feeding out to the motors from, um, because a PWM waveform um, uh, puts a lot of this, you know, uh, noise and high spikes, and so you want to make sure you have um, inverter duty wire, um, and also that we put the cabling because over time it'll destroy the. Um, the insulation on the uh, on the wire and so and also we put you know a lot of it into a braided cable that will also um, dissipate you know any um, any noise so it can't you know get into your um, heaters your you know color feeders you know and those things so it can't carry on forward let's see I also do have available if you would like um, uh, you know, send me an email or whatever, but it's important also to understand, you know, what causes motor failure. Um, and so this has a, been a nice, you know, chart that I found that, you know, this shows like here, if it was a you know, spike in power, this shows if it ended up being single phased, this shows if it would have, typically this happened if it's been dragging, you know, burns insulation and then shorts here. But it, it kind of gives it a, a simple tool to kind of pinpoint you know, where the motor problems are coming from if they do show up. Uh, let's see. So what I'd like to do is, you know, go ahead and open it up for questions, um, you know, and just, you know, open up your mic and, uh, you know, ask questions. We're both here to, you know, answer what we can and what we can't, uh, we'll get you the information. You know, to help you along um, so that, you know, the, the retrofits and the changes that you do or do in your factories, um, you know, feel free also to reach out to either Barnaby or I. Um, but if anybody has any questions, uh, any other comments you had, Bar Barnaby, before we open it up? Uh, no, no, far away with questions. I think that's a really good idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. There was a question here by, um, uh, it says, how, you know, how can we reduce those, you know, harmonics and power? And maybe you can, do you want to, you want to take a stab at that Barney or what we do? Yeah. I mean, um, like you say, um, you can get passive filters. Um, if you've got harmonic problems, get passive filters or active filters 
that can sit on the behind the drive, basically between between the uh, or right next to the drive and the supply, and that will filter out those um, harmonics uh, fifth, fifth and seventh mainly, which gives you the main problems. Um, that those are the way to get rid of the harmonics with the with the supply. Again, with big systems out the box, most you'd go 12 volts or go six phase. Um, I worked on a, a DC system, which is about 11.2 megawatt. And that was actually 24 pulse and uh, um, 12 phases. Uh, again, it was it was installed at the point of installation, so um, it was costed into the job. When you go when you do put a phase shift transformer in, it can be expensive because you've got extra windings and the transformers aren't straightforward to build. Obviously, that being a phase shift, it tends to be a little bit more complicated, and so fetch a small premium. And then also. Um, you, you, you probably want to need to bridge reactors as well between the two two stacks. But the main way to get rid of harmonics is uh, on, say, um, in a factory, is to put uh, ha harmonic filters in, um, uh, and that should get rid of it. Yeah, and so what I always recommend is that they do go back, um, you know, and put the power analyzer on it um, so we can see what we're actually dealing with. And both... You, you'll, you'll hear a lot of them talk about point of common coupling, um, which is what in the United States would require you to be to stay in IEEE compliance. But um, where point of common coupling is actually out at the transformer. Well, that's at the you know primary side of the high voltage. And so we and the, that's what the power company, they're worried about their their circuits, their lines. And so that's what they put it as. But I recommend that you put it you know, put a metering. I know when I did a bunch of work for Sterilite Corporation, they um, had, uh, you know, a, a very, you know, big, um, uh, originally an a lot of inductive load. And then a lot of machines were converted over to uh, AC inverters on them um, to basically help, um, you know, get their power factor back in line, plus get the, you know, motors all running more efficiently. Um, but what we did first, we took a snapshot of where we were, you know, on each 2000 amp service and took an evaluation of what, what the harmonics really were. Um, because one machine can also help cancel the others. And we've actually found the result to be quite a bit lower, you know, than what, you know, you can pencil out on paper. So I do recommend you get a snapshot, um, you know, right after your, you know, on your 480 volt side or 400 volt or 380 you know whatever you're doing you know get, get it on the low voltage side which is on your side um and determine what that what those spectrums look like um i have a turn so we, we can actually do some snapshots of what the voltage is looking like and you know what these um harmonic you know currents are looking like and get the full full detailed um you know, it, it shows us like this happened to be, you know, of the fundamental current um, in harmonic order, the third, you know, was in a little over, um, you know, 1%. Um, but the fifth, um, you know, was clear up to about 23% in the seventh. So what we wanted to do is clean this up. So that way, then this data can be, you know, brought back properly you know, to the design engineers on the harmonics so that we can design and get the right filter here um, with the right capacitance and the right inductance in here. And also check it at um, various load ratings, you know, put part of your machine, you know, when, leave it on there for a little while and, um, you know, take the evaluation over time. And that's what's nice about the fluke meter is actually you can, in our time record, you know, several days if you want, um, and get that, you know, get that evaluation done. Um, has, um, has anybody got an application they're working on or thinking of doing that they want to chat about or, or ask questions about? Um, yeah, it doesn't sound like they. Yeah. 
they do at this point. Um, but uh, that, that's what, you know, I, I, I like to do things as my dad always said, you know, keep it simple. Um, you know, a lot of people want to go on, you know, just say, okay, well, I want to put a harmonic filter on whatever. I like to go find out what the source is actually doing um, and really see what the effect is um, because, you know, motors and, and loads and torques, you know, are, are, are all inherent into what that, you know, ultimate value is, um, you know, and we can either do the individual drives, um, you know, or we can do the, you know, the package system, you know, ready to go, um, you know, so it's, you know, if you need the harmonic, you know, filtering reactors and those things to, to keep it, you know, extremely clean, we can build those into the system also. Um, I greatly appreciate everybody's, you know, time today. And, uh, and we are here for more questions if you have them. Um, at any time, you could send us a email. Um, this is my email, and I'll forward it on to Barnaby, you know, if it's in his area. Um, and, you know, we'll do everything we can to, uh, to assist you in, um, you know, setting up, you know, the best, best installations and the best equipment possible. Um, because that's what, you know, makes the quality um, high. So, any application? I mean, don't think it's just extruders, uh, fans, pumps, um, hydraulic pumps, um, variable speed drives. You fitted uh, big, big inverters to uh, hydraulic pumps for energy saving, to dropping the uh, rate down, or or even soft starts for energy saving. So, uh, any application you think with for a motor give us a shout we've, we've pretty much done everything between roger and myself we've done every application you can think of uh from aerospace to uh to um to formula one to plastic steel paper uh anything like that give us a shout and uh, we'll try and help you